Hey, good morning, Christ Church. How are we doing? Good. I'm glad to hear it. Well, if you are new to Christ Church, we'd love to welcome you into our gathering today. There will be uh, songs that we sing in worship of our God. There's going to be teaching from Scripture. And we'll do a few other things as well. After the service, we would love to invite you uh, into the lobby to go to our, our welcome center out there. We have a small gift for you. We really would love to get to know you and, and see what you're interested in in Christ Church and how we might be able to help you get plugged in here. So please, after the service, if you would, uh, come greet us at the Welcome Center. I want to introduce somebody uh, that some of you from Christ Church may know, but most of you probably don't know. Uh, this is my friend Tia Ross Sath. She's from Roth International. Would you give her a warm Christ Church welcome as she joins us today? So Tira is a, all the way from Cambodia. That's her home, and she has come to join us um, this Sunday. We're so honored. Tira, I want you to tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your beautiful country. So Jumripsu is our Cambodia greeting. Greeting from Cambodia. My name is Tira Saad. From, uh, I am working for Rafa as a country director. And um, Cambodia is 97 is Buddhism. And um, I uh, love my country. It's a lot of rice field, and we eat a lot of rice. Yeah, <laughs> lots of rice. Um, that is true. I had a lot of rice when I went in January with a few other people from our church. We wanted to go see the work of Rafa. We were interested in supporting their uh, ministry in an ongoing nature. And while we were there in January, we got to meet the one and only Tira. She actually convinced me uh, to eat a tarantula. And when I say eat a tarantula, I ate one leg because uh, I could not do the whole thing. And she finished it off for me. So... <laughs> She's super fun. We actually started our ongoing support of Roth International in July of this year, but we liked Tara so much, wanted her to come and be the one to uh, present Rafa to our church um, because she's so awesome. Tara, who is Rafa International? What kind of work do you all do? So Rafa, we work in Cambodia, Thailand and Haiti, actually, and also in uh, United States and Jobland too. But in Cambodia, we have two big program. One is prevention program and second one is a, a safe house for the girl who are not safe in community. So for prevention program, we are support the kid going to a university, get a school over there, but we also try to prevent them uh, before it happened by sex trafficking. And also at the safe house, we are provide the safety for the girl who are not been uh, safe at community, so we are searching under the, the kid were under age, like from six years old to 18 years old, and also we provide education, social work, and counseling. But also we, after we working with them, get healing, we reintegration them back to community, what is a safe place for them also. Rafa does great work in Cambodia and multiple countries, even here through their Hope and Healing Center in Jop. And we're honored to be ministry partners with Rafa International now. And uh, I want to let you know that we last week just recorded a podcast with Tira and uh, the lady Angela Brower who leads the, um, the Hope and Healing Center there at, at Rafa here in Joplin. And it would be awesome if you could give some attention to it this week as you uh, consider the way in which you personally might support Roth International through your giving or through your prayers. And I want to give a little bit of a teaser to the podcast because Tira's story is phenomenal. Her family's testimony is quite amazing. It shows the grace of God in full display. So you may know um, in history there was an event that happened in Cambodia called the Khmer Rouge. Khmer Rouge was a genocide in Cambodia. It wiped out millions of people. It was a horrible act of history. Her family had to flee Cambodia and go to Thailand. There in Thailand, uh, they met missionaries who presented the gospel to them. They became believers in Jesus. And then what happened after that is absolutely remarkable. So we'd love for you to consider listening to those podcasts that we're going to be releasing this week. Friends, uh, Tira is going to be back out here in just a moment. Would you give her another welcome to Christ Church as she heads backstage? <laughs> We have a couple of announcements this morning that I have the joy to make. So uh, a couple weeks ago, Teresa Barnes, who is our women's minister here on staff, came to me in the office and she said, Drake, what kind of cobbler do you like? What's your favorite? And I said peach cobbler. And I thought Teresa was going to be making me a peach cobbler, you know? That was a nice, fun thing to do for your coworker. Turns out she's not. Tomorrow night is ladies' night, and they're having cobbler there. So ladies, if you want to go eat cobbler, there's going to be cobbler there. There's going to be worship. It's going to be a fun night of fellowship. And I learned that I am exclusively not invited to that gathering. So go and eat some cobbler for me. 
In all seriousness, if you're looking for some good community here at Christ Church, this is a great opportunity. If you're looking to bring a friend or a neighbor or a coworker uh, to join you here at Christ Church and discovering completeness in Jesus, ladies, this is a great opportunity. Now, fellows, we are not left without a gathering because Spencer, uh, I'm gonna say a different last name, Spencer Hahn has uh, provided an opportunity for us this Friday morning um, at the Mining Days Event Center in Webb City. It's a men's breakfast where we get to come. It may not be cobbler, but it's gonna be good breakfast, all right? An encouragement from the word as we continue our study of the book of Hebrews. It's going to be awesome. Once again, fellas, a great opportunity. If you're looking to plug deeper into the relationships here at Christ Church, if you're looking to bring a friend or a neighbor to join you here at Christ Church and discovering completeness in Jesus, these are great opportunities for the men and women in our church. So I'd hope you consider doing that. Lastly, super exciting, before we sing praise to our God, we have a baptism to celebrate. So would you stand up on your feet and celebrate this baptism as a young lady in our church family gave her life to Christ. church we gather with confidence this morning singing to a good and faithful God trusting that sin and death and shame have been defeated forever so our God is worthy of our worship today worthy of our attention and so we fix our eyes on him this morning as we see
the worlds thy hands have made And I see the stars And I hear the rolling thunder Thy power throughout the universe display And then sings my soul faithful. So Father, we are grateful people this morning that we get to live in the promise. 
promises of our King and that we get to trust you even deeper. As we come to our time of communion where we take the bread and the juice, I want you to have this thought on your mind. Jesus sets the captives free. And the work of Rafa International is partaking in that, literally physical aspects of setting captives free. But we know too that we were once enslaved to sin and Jesus set us free. And he's doing it all over the world by his grace. Here in our community, in Cambodia, in Tiraz community. And there's a vision that John has in the book of Revelation, chapter seven, that testifies to this, that every nation, tribe, people, and language, those who have been rescued by Jesus will gather around the throne and worship him. So believer, as we take this meal today, I want you to know that we're taking this meal with the global family that calls Christ King. 
I'm going to read from Revelation chapter 7, and then Tira is going to pray in her heart language, Kamai. And I'm going to ask that you would pray in your heart language, whether it's English or Spanish or another language, that you worship God after we take this meal. If you would, go ahead and bow your heads, close your eyes as we read this vision from Revelation. John wrote, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever, amen. Then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Jesus sets the captive free. Let's go to God in prayer. ប្រកងត្រងសម្រាប់ព្រះអង្គដែលព្រះអង្គបានផ្ដោព្រះលោហិតរបស់ផងត្រង <laughs> ស្រីឡាញ់របស់ផងត្រងឲ្យពួកយើងទាំងអស់គ្នាបានស្គាល់នៅអ្វីៗដែលត្រង់បានផ្ដល់ឲ្យពួកយើងទាំងអស់គ
Amen. Yeah, let's celebrate for sure. God is good and he, and he cares for children all over the world. And we get to be a part of the work that Rafa does as the hands and feet of Jesus in Cambodia and Thailand, Haiti here in Joplin as well. So church, if you don't give, I would encourage you to start giving. If you do give, thank you for giving. Um, Because your 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 dollars, your gifts go to good work, helping people discover completeness in Jesus, both here and that little girl in Cambodia. So thanks for giving. Tira, would you mind praying and ask God to bless this offering? អាវ័យទាំងអស់ដែលត្រង់បានអពុកគេដាក់ដងវាយដើម្បីជួយដល់ប្រជាជនក៏ដូចជាកុមារនៅប្រទេសកម្ពុជាដែលជាក្រុម
that the God of thunder would strike you down immediately. And this old man is going to come tear it down. So they just let it happen. But he took that ax and he began to wail on it over and over and over. And then it says this wind began to blow and everyone just is silent, sitting there stunned. And that tree falls to the ground. This old monk tears down the powerful oak of Thor. This representative of Christ defeats this God of thunder. Why would he do this? Because Boniface had experienced Jesus. He experienced the glory of God. The glory of God, it does not leave us the same. It makes us zealous. It makes us passionate. It makes us concerned for the name and the reputation of our God. And it satisfies so completely. And it's why David says in Psalm 27, one thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. It means something. And so today we are asking this question, how do we get into the presence of God? How can we experience God's glory? How can we become zealous and passionate and totally satisfied in him? How do we walk with Jesus? And so we're going to look at the hope of heaven, the doubt of heaven, and the God of heaven. The hope, the doubt, and the God of heaven. So let's look at the hope of heaven. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Hebrews 10. That's where we're going to start. We're going to pick up on. We're going to look at this text, expand upon it. I'll give you a moment to flip your Bibles there. But our hope is that by the end, we could begin to see a God who is totally accessible to us and a God who is totally near and speaks. But what I want you to hear as we read through it is just the details of what's being communicated to us. So Hebrews 10, 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, remember that, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful." And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Okay, so why did I call this the hope of heaven? Well, you can actually see it when it talks about where Jesus is. It says that he's in the most holy place. Now, what is the most holy place? Well, I want you to imagine a kingdom, okay? If you're in a kingdom, where would you find the king? on his throne. If you're a religious person, where would you find God? In a temple or in some sort of religious place. The most holy place is really a combination to these things. It's connected to these ideas. It is the place where you would expect to find the king of the universe. And by the way, everybody is looking for the king of the universe. Everybody is. They want to know if he's there at all. And if he is, they want, they have more questions. What do I do? What, what, what do you require of me? You see, if, if there is a king of the universe and he's sitting on a throne and you're living in his kingdom, you would want to know, how am I supposed to live? What rules should I follow? But even more than that, you would be interested to know if there was access to this king, if you could make requests of the king, if you could be in the king's favor. That would be something meaningful, something special. And so here, Hebrews is actually making a comparison What I want you to to notice here is he's talking about this thronely temple room. And so what he's saying to every Gentile in the Roman world who would have been seeking a temple in all these different places, you know, there's tons of temples in this place. And he's saying, that's not the right one. You're never going to find the king of the universe there. But then what's interesting is then he turns to the Jews and he said, actually, you're looking in the wrong place too. And that's what's interesting. Because the Jews had a temple where God really did dwell where his presence really was at. But in order to get close to this, in order to get near it, they had to make a sacrifice for themselves. And then they had to have others make sacrifices for themselves. And they had to be concerned about their lives and how clean they were and what they did the night before and all these different things. If they were going to get anywhere near God and then only one person, the high priest, one person, the high priest once a year got to go in. And this event became the most important event in Israel. This day when the high priest would go in into the most holy place became known as the day of atonement. So like a good teacher, I'm going to make you repeat it back to me. So everybody say day of atonement. atonement. Very good. This is one of the most important moments 
within the people of, people of Israel because the high priest would have to make sure he was clean. The high priest would have to make sure he was in a proper way to get anywhere near these things. So they, you know, it's rumored that they would tie a rope around their legs so if they went in and they died, they could just pull them out because that's how trepidatious this was, to go into the presence of God. But the, here was his, his, his throne room. Here was the temple. Here was his presence. Now, perhaps, you can see how incredible this passage really is. Because at one level, it's saying that Jesus is in the true most holy place. Not one built by hands, but he's in heaven, where God's presence truly dwells. He's in heaven. But then, it says, you can enter too. Thus the hope. The hope of heaven. Jesus is in heaven. You can enter too. How? Well, it tells us. And I want you to notice here that this verse gives us a really clear way, not only that we understand how to get into heaven, but how we understand the whole Old Testament. Have you ever read the Old Testament and been like, I don't know what that's saying? Well, this verse should hopefully be helpful. Listen to what it says. If you guys would put that verse up 19 through 22. And I'm going to just start to point some things out. Look in verse 19. It says, Jesus is the better sacrifice by which his blood cleanses us. In verse 19, and it's in, in verse 20, it says, it says that Jesus is a better curtain, albeit it's a torn one, but it opens the way to everyone. In verse 21, it says he's the better high priest who goes into the most holy place, the better most holy place, who offers himself as the sacrifice, who tears the curtain, barring entrance through his own sacrifice. He's saying every part of the Old Testament is fulfilled in Christ. Every part of it. Why do we have all these things in the Old Testament? Because they're pointing to Christ. He's the high priest. He's the better sacrifice. He's the better blood that purifies our lives. And he is the, the curtain torn so that we get, the, we get to go in. So how do we get into heaven? Well, I hope you picked it up. What is the hope of heaven? It is the gospel. Do you want heaven? Do you want the presence of God? Do you want access to the king of the universe? Do you want to experience transcendence, glory, purpose, life? This passage says that you can because somebody else went in on your behalf when you couldn't. Somebody else died the death that you should have died. Somebody else's blood purifies your life so you never, ever have to ask whether you can have access to a king like that. That you can go in and experience life with the king. But then we have another problem. How do we draw near to God through Jesus if Jesus is in heaven? Like, what does heaven have to do with right now, today? I want to experience God's glory. I want to taste the transcendent. I want to be passionate like Boniface. I want to burn with that sort of zeal. But how can I, when he's up there and I'm down here, he's far away and I don't see him? As long as I don't see him, I don't understand how to experience Jesus. And that, that is when doubt comes in. Let's look at the doubt of heaven. You see, the whole book of Hebrews is a letter to those struggling with doubt. And you can actually hear it in our passage as well. When it says, let us draw near with all assurance. Let us hold unswervingly to hope. Let us not give up meeting together. And the translation to this is, some of you are backing off. Some of you are giving up hope. Some of you have stopped attending the gathering. Some of you are doubting. Now, why are they doubting? Well, they're doubting for all the same reasons we doubt. I'm going to give you three. The first is that they're suffering. Hebrews 10, 32 says, remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You see, this suffering is both public, it's private, it's physical, it's emotional, it's happening all around, all around you. And when suffering comes in, when it surprises you, because it almost always does, but when it comes into your life and it makes, you, it makes you see all that you lack, it reveals actually also what you trust in. It says, okay, so what do you actually think is most important? What is it that you cling to that is something outside of God? And then when we don't have a good answer to that question, when we feel like God is beating us up, when we don't understand what is happening, we start to ask those questions like, why won't you help me? What have I done? Are you not good? Do you not care? How do I escape this? And so instead of suffering, making us long for heaven, 
It makes us doubt the God of heaven. Instead of drawing near to God, we draw near to anything else that makes the pain go away. Instead of trusting the promises of God, we trust the promises of a bottle, of a therapy, of an older way of life. Maybe I just go back and do the things I used to do. And that leads to our second reason they're doubting. They're doubting because they're struggling intellectually. You can hear this as soon as the book opens. It's all of these, it's being written to a largely Jewish audience who are trying to decide, like, is Jesus really the fulfillment? Is he really the Messiah? Is he really what we should be expecting? And that's why it says in Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. The entire audience is like, I get the prophets. I know the prophets. I don't know about Jesus. Are we sure that he's actually the Messiah? Does he check all the boxes? In fact, you could probably make the argument that Hebrews is kind of one big intellectual persuasion toward Jews who, who, who haven't yet seen or understood Jesus as being the person who, who really is who he says he is. And so they're doubting. They're doubting because they've got people chirping in their ears. They're doubting because they have people questioning their beliefs or simply outright mocking them. They're doubting because there's these other ways of salvation, other ways of life that kind of seem legit and sometimes even wonderful. But Hebrews is very clear throughout the entire book. Those alternative paths only lead to destruction. Instead of reaching heaven, you will get hell. Instead of a garden, you will get desert. And that's why in Hebrews 3.12, he says, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. As has just been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he hungry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. He's talking about the people who were led out of Exodus. They saw all the wonders of God, and yet they got into the desert, and they didn't see God, and they doubted whether or not he was actually leading them anywhere at all to a true promised land. That's what we struggle with. Is God truly leading us to a promised land, to the most holy place, to the presence of God? But notice what the author of Hebrews does. He doesn't just say, would you just shut up and believe? No. He didn't say that. Faith isn't leaping into the dark with no reason at all. It's not like just deciding one day you need to get to the other side of this chasm and you don't know if there's anything there, so I'm just going to go ahead and jump. That's not faith. That's gambling. Faith is believing, but it is believing based off of evidence and experience. It's based off of the stories of God. It's based, more importantly, off of the person and work of Christ. It is believing that there is going to be something on the other side, not out of wishful thinking, but because of the hope you have already experienced. And that's what the author of Hebrews is appealing to as he goes back to these stories that they all know really well. He's saying there is exceptional evidence for this, so let me show you. And then he unpacks it. The author simply will not let the skeptic walk away that easily. There have always been intellectual giants who follow Jesus as king as much as country bumpkins. And that's because God's grace does not care about any of those things. He doesn't care if you're rich or poor, smart or dumb, black or white. God's grace penetrates every part of our lives. And that's why in the first century and even today, Christianity is the most diverse religion in the globe. Because God's grace reaches every part of what humanity actually needs fundamentally. I wish we had more time to, to go into that, but I have to go to the, our third doubt. Our third doubt is this, they struggled with sin. Hebrews 12, four says, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Now sin makes us doubt in a unique way. Suffering makes us say, is God really there? Intellectual doubting makes us say, is God really there? But sin, it says, does God really love me? Would he even want to be in my presence? You see, when we have sin in our life, secret sins, big sins, embarrassing sins, the, the doubt becomes whether God will want to have anything to do with us at all. And this wrestle with sin is a major theme of what's happening in the book. The Jews here, they've entered into something and they are wondering whether it would be worth just going back to their old ways, purifying themselves the way they used to, offering new sacrifices, trying to do something different so that they're good with God. 
It's kind of like somebody who gets baptized like seven times. Like maybe the sacrifice of Christ wasn't good enough and I just need one more time so God really knows I'm really here this time. Misunderstanding the point that baptism is not something you do. It's something you receive. It's something God is doing in your life, not something you're just giving to him. Baptism is not a work being done by you. It's a work being done by God. It is a symbol and a sign of your belonging to the covenant king. And here we are doubting whether or not this could be true at times because sin still interrupts our lives. On the other hand, some of us will just give up and we'll just walk away. The sins are too big. Like we know heaven, we know God, we've heard of these things, but you walked in today and you were like, am I gonna catch on fire walking into this place? People feel that way. They feel this doubt toward God because of the sin that they struggle with. And they're not just big sins. Sometimes they're small sins, the little ones, things which gradually get us off the path, sins we do that, that really keep us from longing from heaven at all. They make us far too comfortable in this world. We don't really care to go to another one. In fact, these are sometimes the most dangerous because we don't even realize it's happened until all of a sudden we're way off course, way off track. We're into the wilderness. Maybe the simplest way to say this is this. Big sins make us doubt because they ask, does God really love me? And little sins make us doubt because they say, do I really need God? This is what doubt does. And all of these doubts compound. All of these doubts play together to magnify a problem. If there is a king of the universe, if there is, of course I would want to know him if there was one. Of course I would want to draw near. Of course I'd want to experience this glory, this, this God of heaven. But I'm on earth. He's there, I'm here. How do I behold the wonder of Jesus if he's in the most holy place and I'm down here on this crusted ball? How does that work? And I keep hearing what people tell me. They keep saying, well, just look at Jesus. Just look at Christ and keep your eyes on him. Everything will, uh, what am I looking at here? He's up there, I'm down here. How do I get my eyes on the king? And now we're asking the right questions. These are the questions that the people of Hebrews were asking, that they were struggling and wrestling with. Now we are ready to overcome our doubts. Let's look at the God of heaven. How do we draw near to the God of heaven? Well, ironically, he makes it actually pretty clear. It's not by physically looking at him. He, we see this in verse 19 when Jesus says that he's on, not on earth, he's in the most holy place, the true one. And then it confirms that in verse 25 when it says that the day is approaching, meaning the day is approaching when you're gonna see him face to face, meaning that day ain't today. It's not here yet. That's what we look forward to. We look forward to seeing his face, but we're not going to see him that way. And this is the problem. This is why doubt creeps in. This is what hinders our ability to enjoy God to the fullest. It's because the, the things that we see most prominently all the time are the things that make us doubt. We see suffering. We see questions and mocking. We see this, this sin in our life. How? How do we draw near to God? How do, we, how do you draw near to something you cannot see? But the text answers this question. It says, faith. Hebrews 12, 22. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. It takes faith. It takes belief. It takes trust. What is faith, though? <laughs> what does that mean? Hebrews 11 one actually defines exactly what it means. It says, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And I know what you're thinking. There he goes again. That preacher, he's telling me to jump over a chasm, not being able to see anything. He's telling me to just leap in some ridiculous fashion over into nothingness with no evidence at all. But no, I'm not. And neither is Hebrews. Now, to be fair, Hebrews is very clear. It does not expect you to jump by what you see. It is clear about that. But that doesn't mean it, have, it has no evidence at all. In fact, Hebrews is trying to make the point that it's actually your eyes that are the problem. That what you're seeing is making you, you second guess what, you are, what you're actually hearing. You see, Jesus is in heaven and you aren't going to see him until that day comes, but that faith allows us to, why? It tells us in Romans 10, 17. It says, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word about Christ. Why trust your eyes more than your ears? You see, what it's saying is faith is, faith is blindly jumping across a chasm. It is, but only because you hear the voice on the other side that knows everything about you, 
that speaks to you in your worst moments, that moment where your conscience is moving and the spirit is convicting and it's encouraging and it's counseling, it's saying there is a voice on the other side that knows everything about you, how you have been harmed and how you have harmed, and yet it still says, come to me, trust. You are living in a world where you can see everything and yet it is blinding you to what you can actually see. If you jump across here, you'll not only experience your joy from suffering and your, your, answer, your questions answered. You'll not, you won't just experience the, the forgiveness of every sin, but you will get to see the sound of this voice. He's saying, come and jump into this place. Come jump to me, jump to my life because the blood of Jesus has purified you. You can jump, I'll save you, I'll rescue you, I'll hold you. I'm in, I am preparing a place for you. It's going to not be a wilderness, but a garden. It's going to be a place where all pain is eradicated. It's going to be what you truly long for, but you must jump across. You see, this is the voice that every person who belongs to God from the beginning to end has always responded to. Those, even in the Old Testament, who were saved by faith, who didn't have Jesus, but were responding to the word of God that they heard was the voice of Jesus. Did it, does John not say that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God, the word was for God? Jesus has always spoken from the beginning to the end, calling his people to himself. How do we experience God's glory? That's the question. And the point is, you don't see it, you hear it. You hear the word of God and it brings something out in you that changes your life. And so what I wanna do today, I'm gonna invite you to hear, to listen. What I wanna do is I'm gonna read the word of God. And if it, I want you to leave all distractions out. If it means closing your eyes, if it means just putting your head down, if it means reading with it, through, you know, with me, like do that. But I want you to hear, hear it. Here's what it says in Hebrews eleven seventeen. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. So in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshiped as he leaned on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land, but when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and holes in the ground. 
These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Therefore, church, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith for the joy set before him. He endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The glory of God is through his word. And we experience, we know the glory of God, not because we see it and it scorches our retinas, but because we hear it and we feel it burning in our chest. It is the trumpet sound that is blasted and a symbol and a signal for the entire world that sin and death have lost. It is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating to the very depths of your soul. And we feel its call to us, come and die and therefore live. Live. The word of God would breathe forth something out of nothing once more, not just the created universe, but a life, a beating soul, breathing and bleeding again in ways, every, every way that God has called us to. The word of God speaks but he has given us something to see. By the grace of God, he actually has given us something to behold. And you know what it is? The people of God, the people who have been changed by that word, who have been brought from death to life, gathering together in a room like this to love and to serve and to worship the king. That's why he says, don't give up meeting together. Don't let doubt keep you from gathering because when you look around, you'll be surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses who have heard what you have heard and seen what you have seen. And when you see marriages restored and families healed, when you see brokenness repaired, when you see sin repented of, when you see darkness overcome by light, you will know that the word of God speaks, that the gospel of Jesus Christ has been proclaimed, that a revival can break out and the spirit can burn and things, people can change because it will not lead leave you the same. And that is why I love the story of Boniface. Because here is a man who heard the word of God, who has been saved by the gospel proclaimed, and he goes to a place he doesn't belong. He cuts down a tree he should have never touched, and everyone stands around not knowing what to do. And so he preaches the gospel. And you know what they do? They repent of their sin and they fall on their knees and they worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. And they take that tree and they cut it up and they make a church out of it. And they gather in that church to proclaim the excellencies of the one who has called them out of darkness. That is what we are here to do, to respond to the word of God with a word of our own. And what I find interesting is that what we most long for is to see God what we most long for is to behold the wonder of all that he is. But he speaks to us. That day is coming, but he speaks to us for now. Ironically, what God sees all the time is all of us. But what he most longs to hear, to see, is us speaking to him, is us worshiping him, that his voice would be met with our own. That's what we're here to do today to allow the word of God to shape our hearts and then offer it back to him with an anthem of praise. Prayer, life together, to experience life with Jesus. Would you stand as we offer that word back to him? is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I 
dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly trust in Jesus name so we sing Christ alone and Christ alone cornerstone the weak age and the Savior's love is who the soul he on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale I anchor holds with me no matter the season we can sing this my anchor holds within the veil and Christ deserves our glory, he deserves all attention, all focus. And as we close today, I want to remind you, if the Spirit has spurred something in you that you want to go deeper, you hear it all the time, that we want every person to experience completeness in Jesus, we have ways for you to do that. We have people in the back of the room that are at tables that would love to pray with you, that would love to walk with you. And we also have a pathway center that is full of resources to equip us, God's people, that we may go deeper, that we may experience him more fully. And so as we close, I just want to close with a passage from Hebrews chapter 10 that Elijah read during his message as our benediction. Church, do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. And but my righteous one will live by faith. 
and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. Church, may you exercise your faith this week, going deeper into our good and faithful King. You are dismissed. Thank you.